Before I begin, I wish to point out that the views I expressed in this lecture are my personal views. They do not represent the views of the state government of Sarawak or the state attorney general's chambers. When I chose this topic for this lecture, I did not foresee that the emergency laws would be a subject of intense parliamentary and public interest. We know what has gone on over the last few days. There are a lot of issues in race and a lot of controversies surrounding what happened to the proclamation of emergency that is currently still enforced and the ordinances made after that emergency was proclaimed on the 11th of January 2021. I do not intend to, uh, emerge, to submerge myself in trying to discuss those controversies because I do not think that by this lecture we can contribute to the solution. Uh, before I begin, I want to say that this is not a political forum. Although during the lectures, I cannot avoid making references to political events, past and present, associated with the emergency laws that were introduced since Malaysia Day. Uh, why this lecture? Because emergencies have great consequences, both on the personal liberty of the subject, their security, the security of the country, the peace and harmony of the people, as well as their health and wealth and environmental welfare. At the same time, all emergency laws are said to be quite draconian. And the powers that can enact such laws, the awesome powers for making such laws are vested with the Yang Di Agong, acting on the advice of the Prime Minister. So, in the light of what has been happening of late, uh, this is a topic of some great interest. And I will try to explain the laws as I see them and to share with you my own knowledge and thoughts on these laws. Okay, uh, let me now begin by giving you the agenda for this talk. Uh, I will explain the basis of the emergency provision under the Federation of Malaya Constitution. There's a mistake there. It should be Malaya Constitution 1957, huh? not Malaysia. Uh, that is because the Malayan Constitution was subsequently adopted with amendment on Malaysia Day to become the Constitution of Malaysia. Then I will discuss the Malaysia Agreement and the emergency provisions in the Malayan Constitution. I will explain why uh, Sarawak agreed at the point of signing the Malaysia Agreement to adopt a constitution with these emergency provisions. Which, unable, which confers awesome powers on the authorities to proclaim emergency and to make laws in order to address the emergencies uh, that has arisen. 
I would touch on the effects of Article 150 of the Federal Constitution and to discuss the proclamation of emergencies since Malaysia Day, including the issue whether there were real emergencies. And then I will discuss the effect of emergencies on the Sarawak state constitution and the powers and the rights of Sarawak. Now, this emergency is a broad subject. I would like to devote most of this talk only to the situation in Sarawak and Sarawak's experiences with the emergency. Okay, uh, I would not want to go beyond that because of the limited time that is available to me. And then uh, we would discuss some conclusions. All right, the next slide. As I explained, the Constitution of Malaya, which was enacted in 1957, was modified and amended to be the Constitution of Malaysia by the Malaysia Act 1963. In the Malayan Constitution, there were already provisions for the Yang Di Pertuan Agong to issue a proclamation of emergency where grave emergency exists. Those were the words huh? used, grave emergency exists. Now, the Reed Commission, this is a commission set up by the British and Malayan government uh, to make recommendation for a Malayan constitution. Uh, this commission recommended that in emergencies such as war or internal disturbances constituting an immediate threat to security and economic life, provision should be made in the constitution for a proclamation of emergency. So the commission's recommendation is there must be emergency powers provided to enable the country to deal with grave emergency. Next. Now, the Rick Commission, in a nutshell, recommended that when the proclamation is enforced, one, the federal government should then have the power to give direction to the state government or state officer or authority which means the government of Malaysia, the federal government will assume some of the powers that are with the state or exercisable by state officers or the state administration. Number two, parliament shall have the power to enact any provision notwithstanding it infringed fundamental rights or state rights. So it's, uh, as I said, some wholesome power given to parliament to enact whatever law that is necessary uh, in order to address the security or other issues giving rise to the population of emergency. If parliament is not sitting, uh, if parliament is not sitting, the government through the Yang Di Potuan Agong can make ordinances having the force of law. That was what happened in January when parliament was not sitting. The Agong promulgated the Emergency Essential Powers Ordinance 2021 coming into effect on the 11th of January 19, uh, 2021. All right, next. As I said, these uh, recommendations of the Reed Commissions were incorporated substantially into Article 150 of the Malayan Constitution. Next, the question is asked, and in fact has been asked, in the case that we know very well, or most of us should know very well. 
did the states of Sabah and Sarawak agree to the emergency provisions in Article 150 of the Malayan Constitution? The Privy Council in Stephen Kaloningkan versus Government of Malaysia decided that the uh, representatives of Sabah and Sarawak by signing the Malaysia Agreement had, uh, and adopting the Malayan Constitution as the Constitution of Malaysia had already agreed that the emergency powers given in Article 150 of the Malayan Constitution be accepted for Sarawak and Sabah. So the issue in the, in, in, uh, shall I say, Ninkan's case was whether during the period of proclamation of emergency issued under Article 150 of the Constitution of Malaysia, uh, Malaysia Parliament can pass an act to amend, to amend the state constitution so as to enable Council Negri to be summoned by the governor so that a vote of no confidence may be moved and tabled against the chief minister who is alleged to have lost the confidence of the members of the Council Negri and hence should not continue in office. Uh, he did not want to call a meeting of Council Negri, so there was a political stalemate which needs to be addressed. Okay, next slide. The Privy Council ruled that the answer to this question was to be found by interpreting the Malaysia Agreement and two documents attached to it, that is Annex A, which is a draft bill for the Malaysia Act to amend the Malayan Constitution for the admission of the new states of North Borneo, Sabah, Sarawak and Singapore, and the Constitution of 1963, Constitution of Sarawak, which was to be given loss by an order in council by Queen Elizabeth II. Now, if uh, you recall, uh, the Malaysia Agreement stipulates that this constitution of Sarawak should be given force by the Queen. Council Negri in Sarawak never passed the Constitution of Sarawak. The Constitution of Sarawak was enacted pursuant to the agreement, Malaysia Agreement, by the Queen through an order in council. All right? Okay? So some people have been saying it is not the Constitution that was passed by the people of Sarawak, but by the Queen for the people of Sarawak. Okay, next. So the Privy Council point is this. It was, it's a judgment delivered by Lord McDermott. He said, more to the point, are the terms of Article 150 as modified by Clause 39 of the draft bill, which is Annex A to the agreement of July 9, 1963. For they go to show that the parties to that agreement must have realized that the powers of parliament conferred by that article during the currency of emergency may be used to amend for the time being the provisions of the Sarawak Constitution uh, of 1963. Meaning, when we sign the Malaysia Agreement, we have agreed to adopt the Malayan Constitution with those emergency powers. And under those emergency powers, Parliament can amend the Constitution of Sarawak. Of course, under the Sarawak Constitution, only the State Assembly the Dewan Undangan Negeri can amend the Sarawak Constitution. All right. Next. 
Why did our representatives who signed the MA63 agree to the emergency provision? It must be recalled that in July 1963, Sarawak faced various threats to its peace and security, namely internal unrest started from the 1962 Brunei rebellion, the Indonesia's confrontation against the formation of Malaysia, as you know, from history, President Sukarno of Indonesia promised to crush Malaysia, all right, and started uh, its hostility against uh, this country. And there were incursions into Sarawak in Sarawak, they also landed in the hall. Next, the spread of communism in Southeast Asia at that material time. Next, when the proclamation of the effects of Article 150 of the Federal Constitution, when the proclamation of emergency is issued under Article 150, uh, the fundamental rights of individual and the rights of the state are affected. This is taken from the judgment of the Chief Justice of Borneo, Campbell Wiley in Ankyo Cheng against the public prosecutor. Ordinances may be promulgated by the Agong, which will have the same force and effect as an act of parliament when parliament is not sitting. Parliament notwithstanding any provision in the constitution may make laws in respect to any matter, if it appears to Parliament, such laws are required due to the emergency situation. Next, the executive authority, in other words, the federal government, can then have authority with regard to any matter within the legislative authority of the state and as power give direction to the state government or state official or authority. Thus, emergency laws passed or promulgated under Article 150 not only affects the fundamental rights of the people, but the rights of the legislative authority, of the legislative authority and the executive authority of the states, including Sarawak. All right. Now, we step back and look at the historic the emergencies that have been proclaimed. On the 3rd of September, 1964, Indonesian confrontation against Malaysia emergency. Uh, this was done because Indonesia A dropped some fighters into Johor. Uh, those who know history will remember that incident where they landed at Moa or Pontian or some places like that. In 1966 and 1977, the constitutional crisis in Sarawak and Kelantan. 1963, emergency arising from racial unrest. 1997, Sarawak, 2005 and 2013 nationwide, emergency caused by haze. 2020, the, there was emergencies declared to, to suspend by elections of parliament or, or the, for the parliamentary constituencies of Batu Sapi and Greek and the state seat of Bugaya. Bugaya. And 2021, January, the proclamation of emergency 2020 to prevent the spread of COVID 19 infectious disease and the pandemic. Of course, Yesterday, there was another emergency which applied specifically to Sarawak, you know, which was signed by the Agong together with the emergency essential powers regulations uh, or ordinance 2021. They come into effect uh, on the 2nd of August, but gazetted on the 30th of July. 2021, yesterday. All right, I will touch on that later. 
they're not in my slides because they came after the slides were prepared. All right. Now, of course, there is no, no dis there should be no dispute because this has been decided by case law of the, from the highest authority that the proclamation of emergency is met by the Agong who has to act on the advice of the prime minister or the federal cabinet. Of course, last year there was an incident where the prime minister and the cabinet wanted to have a nationwide emergency. And that pro proposal was presented to the Agong and the Agong at this, and the conference and the, the Malay rulers had decided that uh, there was no necessity to proclaim an emergency at that point in time. Okay. So the, there has been views expressed whether the prime minister must necessarily act on and follow the advice of the prime minister the prime minister as decreed by article 40 bracket 1a of the federal constitution all right now pursuant to each proclamation legislations were either passed by parliament or propagated by the agong next We now look at the emergency that affects Sarawak. The proclamation of emergency declared on the 14th September 1966. Okay, the proclamation of emergency declared in 1969. The proclamation of emergency declared on 19 September 1997 for the whole of Sarawak when the API index breached 600 mark and the proclamation of emergency 2021 to prevent the spread of COVID-19. Right. Except for the proclamation of emergency in 1997 due to the haze of Sarawak at dangerous level, the other emergency resulted in federal legislation which enacted a uh, man modified or declare some position, provisions of the state constitution as having no effect during the period of the emergency. Unable the federal government to take control of our mineral resources like petroleum in the continental shelf and affects the territory of Sarawak by changing the limits of the state's territorial sea. Okay, we go into detail. The 1966 proclamation of emergency. After this emergency was proclaimed, Parliament passed the 19th, on the 19th of September 1966, the emergency Federal Constitution and Constitution of Sarawak Act 1966 to amend not only the Federal Constitution, but also the State Constitution, which in normal times where there is no emergency, Parliament cannot do, okay? The key provision of the act in regard to the Sarawak constitutions are that uh, by introducing a section granting the governor powers to exercise in his absolute discretion to dismiss the chief minister and members of the Supreme Council if the majority members of the council agree shall pass a resolution of no confidence in the government and two, the chief minister after passing such resolution failed to resign or to tender the resignation of members of the Supreme Council. Section four, the governor was given absolute discretion, notwithstanding anything in the state constitution, to summon meetings of the council negri and to direct in bracket by message to the speaker, the suspension of any standing orders of the council. So these are very drastic uh, provisions. It uh, changes the, the, 
the state constitution. It empowers or give absolute discretion to the governor to summon meetings of the council negri and to dismiss the chief minister. Okay, next. The act also seek to override those provisions in the state constitution relating to the summoning of meetings of council negri and the powers of governor to dismiss the chief minister. Now, we, we said the emergency, that emergency, and the act that was part had the desired effect, right? Acting on the powers provided by the act, the governor was able to summon a meeting of Council Negri, which by majority passed a vote of no confidence against the chief minister. He was dismissed and thereby ending a constitutional crisis caused by the then chief minister who having lost the majority support of Council Negri members, refused to resign or call a meeting of Council Negri to demonstrate that he has the confidence of the majority, right? Next, we come to the 1969 proclamation. This was made under Article 50 to deal with racial unrest following the general elections in May 1969. Although Sarawak was relatively unaffected by the racial unrest which occurred in Peninsular Malaysia, Sarawak was gravely affected by two ordinances promulgated by the Agong under Article 150, bracket 2 of the Federal Constitution. And these are the Emergency Essential Powers Ordinance number 7, which prescribed that any written law relating to land in force in Sarawak shall be construed to be part of the adjacent of the sea adjacent to the coast thereof, not exceeding three nautical miles measured from the low water mark. In other words, the territory of the state, insofar as the ter it includes the territorial waters, is now restricted to three nautical miles. And the Emergency Essential Powers Ordinance Number 10 of 1969, which was brought into force on the 7th November 1969. By Section 2 of, the, of this ordinance, the Continental Shelf Act 1966 and the Petroleum Mining Act, no, the Petroleum Mining Act, there's a mistake. It should be 1966, not 74. Petroleum Mining Act 1966 shall apply throughout Malaysia. Previously, those two acts only applied to Peninsula Malaysia and not to Sabah and Sarawak. Now, I want to explain that when the records will show, the official records do show, that after these two acts, the Continental Shelf Act and the Petroleum Mining Act 1966 were passed, the then state government headed by uh, Dr. Bengulu Tawis Lee resisted attempts by the federal government to extend these two acts over to Sarawak because the government at that time felt that the extension of these two acts to the state would be prejudicial to the state in that we lose control of our natural resources and also our authority over the continental shelf is compromised. Okay, i explain in the next slide. So, as I said, there was resistance by the then state government headed by Dr. Pengulu Tawis Lee on the extension of these two acts. Why? Okay, the Continental Shelf Act vested in Malaysia and exercisable by the federal government 
all rights to the exploration and exploitation of its natural resources that is within the continental shelf, and then prohibit any person from exploring, prospecting, or carrying out operations of getting petroleum in the seabed and subsoil of the continental shelf, except in accordance with the Petroleum Mining Act 1966. Now, the, uh, all right, then in the Petroleum Mining Act, the law prohibits any person from exploring or prospecting or mine for petroleum, except by virtue of a license or petroleum agreement issued by the Petroleum Authority, which for offshore mining, where the national petroleum resources are found, is the Agong. Okay. The state position has been the continental shelf, including its seabed and subsoil, was before Malaysia state land within the boundaries of Sarawak by virtue of the Sarawak alteration of boundaries order in Council 1954. So we do not want to lose the continental shelf, which has been part of state land since 1964 by virtue of that order in Council made by the Queen in London when we were a colony. Uh, after Malaysia Day, of course, when Sarawak joined Malaysia, the territory of the Sarawak was that before, as it was before Malaysia Day. And before Malaysia Day, the territory of Sarawak includes its continental shelf. Okay. Like all state land, the continental shelf is under the exclusive control of the Sarawak government and the petroleum resources being part of state land belong to the state. You see, the Continental Shelf Act vests control of these resources absolutely on the federal government. So this was why the government at that time, headed by Dr. Pengulu Tawis Lee, objected to the extension of these two acts to Sarawak. Okay. Next, the two acts could have been extended to Sarawak as they relate to land and the grant of mining leases and licenses, which were powers under the state legislative authority, and that is provided for in the constitution. However, in an emergency, parliament has the power to pass any law, even laws that could be passed only by the state legislature, and such law cannot be invalidated by reason that it is inconsistent with any provision of the constitution, all right? When the emergency was in force, past, Parliament passed the Petroleum Development Act to vest ownership of the petroleum found both onshore and offshore in Petronas. Consequently, during the emergency, the state lost ownership rights and control over the petroleum resources in Sarawak. Uh, now maybe I take this opportunity to address one of the questions that was sent to me as to why the 1969 emergency lasted until the year 2011 when it was now by parliament. In my view, the federal government kept the 1969 proclamation for all this length of time because if the emergency were to be announced, all laws promulgated under that emergency, if not revoked or now by parliament, will cease to have effect six months eh? after the proclamation ceased to have effect. In other words, when the proclamation say was announced or revoked by parliament, 
at the end of 2011. The ordinance, the emergency ordinance that extended the Continental Shelf Act and the Petroleum Mining Act to Sarawak would cease to have effect about June 2012. All right, June 2012. In which case, those two acts no longer apply to Sarawak. And the, the state can resume regulating the oil and gas industry through the Oil Mining Ordinance 1958, a free Malaysia law. Right? The state government will then have complete control over the issue of mining leases, exploration licenses, and so on for petroleum. Why then, you may ask, that the emergency of 1969 is kept for so long, for 40 over years? Huh? I can only express this opinion that when an emergency is lifted, all the emergency ordinance, including that setting the limit of the territorial waters, would expire or cease to have effect after six months. That is why after 192011, the federal government had to pass the Territorial Sea Act 2012 in order to address the problem. Number seven, having ceased to have effect and the territorial waters would have been reverted back to its previous status before the emergency, at least for the state of Sarawak. Okay, there may be other reason, you know, that it was kept alive for so long. In fact, during these 40 over years, Malaysia did not feel, Malaysians do not feel uh, in any way insecure or threatened or uh, that the country was under any security risk. In fact, between the 1970s and 2011, Malaysia made tremendous social economic progress. All right, next. All right, now I come to this proclamation of emergency, which was proclaimed early this year to contain the spread of the contagious uh, COVID-19 virus. Uh, the Agon and the rulers have decided this emergency will end on the 1st of August, that is tomorrow. Okay, uh, now we can skip the next one because the, that emergency, now that article, that uh, emergency regulation, emergency essential powers ordinance 2021, which came into operation on 11 January 2021. Uh, if it is not now or revoked by parliament, by both houses of parliament, it must be revoked by both houses of parliament, would have effect six months, until six months after the 1st of August 2021. That is why there is this contention, you know, whether, you know, uh, it should be revoked by the Agong or, you know, it can be revoked by the cabinet or it should be re 
revoked by both houses of parliament. Of course, the constitution says that such a legislation passed when parliament was not, was not in session, should be laid before parliament, and it can be announced by both houses of parliament. As you recall, in the case of ordinance number 22, under which that was Sri Anwar Ibrahim was first charged for abuse of power. Before he was charged, there was a motion introduced in the Dewan Riot to announce that ordinance number 22. But that motion was never subsequently tabled in the Senate. Right? The court ruled that that ordinance was not announced because there was only a resolution passed by the Dewan Riot, but there was no resolution passed by the Senate. And they say that because of that, that the Sri Anwar Ibrahim was properly charged for abuse of power under that ordinance. Okay, so it is a requirement that it must be passed by both houses of parliament before it can be revoked. I leave the issue where the cabinet can revoke that ordinance or not uh, to explanation by other people. All right, uh, I, I think we just basically what happens when that ordinance was passed was that the provision in the state constitution, again, you see, under emergency law, you know, the state, the state constitution can be interfered with. Uh, the provisions relating to election to the state legislature shall have no effect. And such election shall only be held on a date the Agong thinks appropriate after consultation with the Yang Dipertuan agree. Under the existing provision, uh, the Yang Dipertuan agree decides on the resolution, on the dissolution of Council Negri or the Dewan Undangan Negri uh, on the advice of the Chief Minister or upon request by the Chief Minister. Okay? The, he, the Yang Dipertuan agree does not have to refer to the Agong, whether he agrees or not to a dissolution. Okay, the provision regarding this, uh, that's the same thing. Uh, the next is relating to uh, the sitting of the Dewan. Okay, that it cannot be held. Uh, uh, Okay, the, the, there's no sitting of the Dewan except on the date to be fixed by His Majesty in consultation with the Yang Dipertuan Negeri for meeting of the Dewan. Under the existing provision of the state constitution, uh, there it is expressly provided that Council Negeri can be called into session uh, either by the uh, Yang Dipertuan Negeri or uh, if it is not, if it is a meeting within a session by the chief minister, all right? So uh, that is how an example of uh, emergency law interfering or modifying or changing the constitution of the state, all right? The new provision, because the emergency uh, is going to end on the first, the current emergency of August. And uh, upon the ending of that emergency, uh, you know, Council Negri or the state legislature would be deemed to be dissolved by the 2nd of August. All right, and an election uh, would have to be held within 60 days after that. 
right? Because of the COVID-19 pandemic situation in Sarawak, it was felt that the election should be suspended uh, until the pandemic situation has been addressed and brought under control. So yesterday, there is a new proclamation of emergency just for Sarawak. So after the 1st of August, the Sarawak will be only state under emergency uh, uh, for a period up to the 2nd of February 2022. The reason for this proclamation is given in the proclamation itself, that is the need to suspend the holding of election while the COVID-19 uh, pandemic is still raging. Okay, now in conclusion, and this is how I feel, uh, uh, the, our courts have ruled consistently uh, there have been criticism that emergency powers have been abused and used in circumstances where emergency situation did not exist. Uh, this is a complaint by Stephen Kaloninkan to the Privy Council. He said, none of the usual signs and symptoms of a grave emergency existed in Sarawak at or before the time of the proclamation. Of course, the Privy Council says uh, this is something for the federal government to judge. Uh, they are in no position to judge whether there was a grave emergency or not. Okay, so this means we come to the next point. The courts have ruled that circumstances which bring about a state of emergency are non justiciable. In other words, they cannot challenge the executive judgment that these emergency circumstances exist. As emergency invariably result in erosion of fundamental rights and liberties of the people and the constitutional authorities of the state and ownership and use of the state natural resources, judicial oversight of the exercise of these extraordinary powers ought to be allowed. Uh, there must be some mechanism to control the exercise of the power rather than the authority given to parliament to revoke a amount, uh, amount an emergency or any ordinance promulgated when an emergency is in force. This is because the majority in parliament belongs to the same political party or coalition as the Prime Minister who advises the Agong to proclaim an emergency. So we need to have some independent oversight. Uh, it is important that uh, you know, the courts should have some degree of authority to review the exercise of such emergency powers. Uh, of course, there are some quarters who say perhaps there should be an amendment to Article 150 to eliminate, you know, emergency, uh, any possibilities of emergency be declared to address some political event. Uh, or crisis. Uh, it remains to be seen whether there is any uh, effort going to be made by the government or by parliament to look into amending Article 150 to 
ensure that in future, these emergency powers are not abused in any way.